Tilburg University presents Taisig Talks. Hello, welcome to the 17th Taisig Talk. Sorry, this is the 18th Taisig Talk. I'm immediately making a mistake in the beginning. Um, Taisig stands for the Tilburg Artificial Intelligence Special Interest Group. And every month we have a podcast and we talk in that podcast about an AI topic with some specialists. Uh, the postcard format is only the, this is the third time we're doing this and there's been some interest in it in the, in the last months. And I got several requests of people who said, can't you uh, tell us a bit more about what artificial intelligence really is? Because one of the goals of these podcasts is to introduce artificial intelligence not only to specialists, because they know a lot about artificial intelligence, but also to a more general public that then can learn about artificial intelligence. So I thought, who can give us an introduction to what artificial intelligence is? And at our university, we have a course, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, and I have two people with me here, Emmanuel Keurleers and Stijn Rotmans, who teach that course. So I thought, I'm going to ask them to talk to us about artificial intelligence. Now, for the people who are live listening in, please keep your microphones off, turn off your image. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. I can watch the chat here and then I can ask those questions. If you have a long question or you would really like to contribute to the discussion, that's possible as well. Then I can open your uh, the speakers and we can actually listen to you. Um, but I assume that um, most of the questions can be asked in the chat. Um, I think yeah, that's it for the introduction. So, Emmanuel, Stein, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm very happy that we can have this talk. Um, do you want to quickly introduce yourselves a bit? So, Emmanuel, you, um, we would usually try to combine a senior and a junior researcher. You're the senior researcher here. Tell That's us good. what your accomplishments are. Uh, I'm an uh, associate professor in the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial uh, Intelligence. Uh, as Peter already said, I'm uh, teaching uh, Introduction to AI. This is basically the big introductory AI course uh, that has about 320 students. All of our bachelor uh, Cognitive science and AI students are in there, uh, but we also have a minor in AI that all of the students of the university can take, and that course is also uh, in there. Uh, my research is uh, on a slightly different field. It's uh, computational psycholinguistics. So it's uh, got um, an intersection uh, with AI. And then uh, Stan, who's uh, next to me, uh, teaches the practicals uh, in, in the course from uh, this year on. Yeah, that's uh, correct. I uh, started last August uh, doing a PhD. And besides the PhD, I also uh, teach a lot. So in the first semester, uh, one of the courses I taught was uh, Introduction to AI. And in these practical sessions that I uh, provided, we uh, mainly focused on the application of some of the methods in artificial intelligence that uh, were taught in the, in the lectures. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I actually, I, I teach also many courses. One course that I taught at some point was um, called Understanding Intelligence. And one thing that I always said in the first lecture there, I don't know what intelligence is. So if I don't know what intelligence is, it might be really hard to know what artificial intelligence is. So do I dare to ask you what intelligence is or should we immediately delve into artificial intelligence? No, you can you can ask us what intelligence <laughs> is because it's a really good question. And, and the way you sidestepped it uh, basically by saying like, I don't know what intelligence is, is usually what's done in artificial intelligence as well, right? So uh, Turing uh, famously uh, came up with this proposal like, let's not uh, focus on what intelligence uh, really is, but we assume that humans have intelligence, right? And so if uh, we have an artificial system that behaves uh, like a, a human being and that we can interrogate and we cannot distinguish it from a human being when it, we test a human on what we think intelligence is, then we assume that that uh, system uh, has some kind of uh, ability to think. Okay. Or, yeah. So very often the, the, the definitions are sidestepped in, 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 uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in these 
issues. But yeah. you're going really far by saying a computer that can think, or because that's what artificial intelligence then would be about. One if you talk things, about yeah. machines having intelligence. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah. That, that like human intelligence, right? Because I think that's what you were referring to is what is human intelligence? But artificial intelligence is an entirely uh, <laughs> uh, different question, which has like four, five, six, or uh, uh, more, more, more answers depending on how you look at it. Okay. Um, so, can so this, this, this then it might be then best. That was my thinking here that we we try to do it uh, in a historical way mm -hmm. because uh, I know and we had a little bit of a talk beforehand and you were also suggesting that the ideas on artificial intelligence have changed over time so um, how did it start uh, what is the let's say the basis of artificial intelligence where, where did we start and then where did it go Somebody can one of you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would say that um, the thinking about uh, artificial intelligence really started with Alan Turing, uh, who uh, well developed this idea of the Turing machine and uh, uh, his test of testing if a machine is really uh, intelligent, if it is distinguishable from uh, human intelligence. So if, you, so if you talk about Turing and Turing machine, what, what time frame are you talking about? It's the 1950s. 1950s. So, and so the artificial intelligence started there? I'd say so, yes. There's also time frames that start uh, a bit or even a lot uh, earlier with, uh, for instance, uh, Descartes thinking about uh, what intelligence is. Uh, but then we're back to the same discussion as, uh, as before. Uh, do we need a grasp of intelligence to really understand what artificial intelligence is? Okay. And if we model it like during um, the as approaching human intelligence, then uh, very soon to that, um, comes uh, figures like uh, Asimov who propose rules that the machines should follow. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now you're gonna go. Now you're really fast. I think <laughs> so maybe we should uh, bring it back a little sure. bit to the core first. So, um, if you say that, um, so you you mentioned Alan Turing, and Alan Turing is in artificial intelligence and a really important figure. He was not the only person who worked on, but he, I think, he was both he did things from a practical side but also from a theoretical side so a more philosophical side um but if we talk about artificial intelligence today usually we talk about really practical things so can we maybe focus um, start to focus there so what is uh, the, the the practical starts of the artificial intelligence so what did people do first what do you need do you need a computer for instance to have artificial intelligence yeah. It, it, it's a good question. I, I think, like, uh, in, in contrast to Stan, I would go further back and basically say, like, there's always been this aspiration that human beings have had that you want tasks for which you ordinarily require human intelligence to per be performed by a system that's not human, right? And in the core, that aspiration is the aspiration for artificial intelligence. Um, it starts to become really interesting the more complex uh, these systems become that you can do tasks with. So you start having mechan mechanical computers in uh, the uh, 1800s, for instance. Those start to be uh, developed. You have um, Charles Babbage's differential engine and really the start of calculators, right? And calculating things is a task for which you would ordinarily require human intelligence. Once machines have achieved that, you could say that is a form of artificial intelligence. What's really interesting uh, about Turing and why that happened uh, in the 1950s is the development of electronic computers. Because at that point, people really start to understand uh, that there's nothing that cannot be done by a computer in terms of operations that you can um, think of. So computers are theoretically able uh, of computing anything. That's what Turing uh, uh, came up with. And from that point, uh, the possibility of doing many, many different tasks for which human intelligence is typically required starts to be a real possibility. And that's why you have typically the start of artificial intelligence is put there. 
So if I, if I try to summarize here, so you say, look, if we, we're not going to define what intelligence is, but we say humans have intelligence mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence is imitating human intelligence somewhere with yeah, something yeah, else. Yeah. That's a definitely a way that you can approach it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the next thing that you said is that basically, if I interpret this correctly, um, the access to a machine such as a computer allows us to, well, allows to do what? To, to, to further this ID or to, to do more? You basically, you say computer is a general machine. Yeah. Um, so that, exactly, it's a general machine. So uh, what, what Turing uh, proved uh, is, is that if you have a computer that has certain functionality and it's not a lot that you need, that you, with that computer, you can do anything uh, in terms of computation. So you can emulate any other computer, any program that you are able to write or to think of, or even a program that can be programmed by a computer itself can be executed on uh, any computer. And so the, the, the possibilities then become boundless. And I think it, when that happened, um, uh, people, AI researchers, really started to be interested first in problems which are easily modeled in a computer. And this is a, a field that you are very familiar with. So computer, sure, but I'm asking you. <laughs> computer games, right? For, for <laughs> instance, games were one of the big first applications of AI. Because typically when we think about it, when people are playing chess, we think like, okay, those are really, really smart people. You need a lot of intelligence to do that really well. And that became a, a, a focal point of AI. Uh, at some point is like, how can we develop systems that play games at a human level or that can perhaps beat uh, uh, human players at, uh, at, at this game? So would you then say that a computer that can play a game is artificially intelligent? Well, in the context of this game, this, um, this artificial intelligence is very intelligent because it's able to beat humans um, and then is sometimes indistingu indistinguishable from humans in that uh, but, but, regard. But, but we, know, we, we know that well, many people, I don't think that there are many people today that say that, well, if a computer can play chess, that it's intelligent. Yeah, I'd uh, agree that, um, well, this, this first uh, notion of, of having an artificial intelligence that really uh, behaves like a human, has a human uh, mind that can function in every aspect uh, thinkable like a human could. And this was uh, for a long, long time a pursuit in AI. And these um, uh, applications like playing chess or playing other games or uh, maybe outside of uh, the game domain, having uh, just specific applications um, has been for um, a long time after that been uh, the focus of development in artificial intelligence. So, okay. So what I hear you say now, if I interpret this correctly, is that we talked about the start of artificial intelligence with computers in, let's say, the 1950s. And and you said okay, uh, and then they said uh, you, you uh, let let let's let the computer play a game to show that's intelligent. But I get the impression for you that the aim was to do more than that. Yes, that's, uh, I'd say so. I, it, it depends on the person, right? And and the approach you 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 would take. So what Stan says is like this pursuit of thinking or acting humanly, and those are two conceptions of AI. There are uh, other conceptions of AI, which is about acting in the best possible way, thinking rational, uh, acting rationally, and um, thinking rationally. And how those problems are solved uh, in AI is very often not by trying to imitate human thinking, but trying to come up with the best possible way of solving a problem. And most of AI is that it's a different way of solving the problem. It's not how humans do it, but very often, it's more successful than what humans do, right? So you achieve uh, better uh, results at playing chess, not by trying to imitate uh, it in the way that humans do it, but trying to play it in the most optimal way and to try to solve that problem. And that for me is definitely AI. 
Um, but AI is a moving target, right? From the moment something is solved and we think, oh yeah, yeah, computers can do that. Then suddenly we think like, oh, that's not artificial intelligence anymore. But it absolutely definitely is uh, 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 um, AI in the sense that you have solved with computers a task that ordinarily you would think requires human intelligence. Okay. Um, I hear now two things. First, you say thinking and you talked about acting. Yeah. So acting is moving a chess piece. Yes. Thinking is how you decide where to move that yes. chess piece. And you say, well, actually the computer moves that chess piece better because it has a so has a different way of thinking or actually it has a way of deciding where to move the chess piece that it can calculate. Um, and, and, and probably we don't know yet what thinking really is. And maybe we, sh again, shouldn't yeah. get into that. But I can imagine that you then would say, look, I actually think that the computer is not intelligent when it plays a great game of chess, but when it plays a game of chess like a human. Yeah, so that's that's definitely uh, uh, something that you 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 could do. So you could think about uh, saying the, the way I want to test if something is intelligent is uh, if it perhaps uh, does things intelligently, but it also makes the same mistakes as humans. But then you take humans, human intelligence as your um, uh, as your objective. And that's not what happens in AI okay. usually, right? <laughs> that's the pursuit that 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 uh, many people have, and many people think that's what AI is. But that is absolutely not what happens uh, in successful applications of AI. Successful applications of AI thus far rely on methods which are distinct from uh, how humans uh, do it. It's not by imitating humans that this is achieved. There are all kinds of romantic ideas that it is that it's like uh, that neural networks, for instance, imitate our brain architecture, but that is honestly, uh, yeah. well, any 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 uh, <laughs> word uh, that you uh, can imagine, it's not true, it's, it's just math uh, and, and nothing more than that. Okay, um, so is then artificial intelligence research, so artificial intelligence research, let's see, because what artificial intelligence really is, uh, we have now an idea about, but the research in artificial intelligence, is that then defined by the problems that it's trying to solve? Yeah, that's definitely one way of looking at it, but maybe uh, Stan, can, uh, <laughs> because he, he uh, his, his research is, is, is perhaps at least in one branch uh, yeah. of AI like uh, that. Uh, in a way, yes. Uh, so the, um, the way of artificial intelligence uh, research is not, uh, as Emmanuel said, to uh, emulate how a human would solve a problem, but to solve problems that humans typically have a hard time solving a problem. And maybe uh, the reason why we have a hard time solving a problem is that we can't think in a certain way uh, that a computer is suitable to well, think, uh, uh, within quotes, uh, in that way. Uh, so for my research, um, it's about finding uh, patterns, uh, discovering uh, related um, events in large amounts of data. And it turns out that humans are uh, quite bad at that. So in a, a, a large uh, database of events, we as humans looking at that are very bad at finding uh, patterns that occur often. Maybe some uh, trivial patterns can be, can be found, mm -hmm. but um, artificial intelligence is, uh, is way better at, at spotting these patterns and, and also at deciding uh, in a way which patterns it should say are important and are interesting. Okay. And which patterns are not. Okay. Uh, what you're describing is uh, commonly known as, as data mining yes. or data science or um, uh, yeah, learning from data. And um, there has been a lot of, so let's say five to 10 years ago, there was a lot of focus and in, in, in research, but in universities and in companies on, on data science. We need to have more data anal analysts, et cetera. And that has shifted a bit to artificial intelligence now, but basically what you're telling me now is it's the same, it's the same topic. 
It's not the same topic, it's a very <laughs> related area. And the same methodologies that are uh, used in, say, data science or in artificial intelligence uh, are applicable to both fields. So, for instance, machine learning is used to, uh, well, it's using uh, methodology from artificial intelligence to well, machine learning making machines learn something. Uh, is in a way uh, acting intelligently and uh, having machines that can learn something is very helpful for data science to be data driven in, in some way to have a data driven uh, company or, or perform research in a data driven way. I have to make a historical note again about this use of this term machine, right? So yeah. <laughs> this is not something recent. Uh, artificial intelligence was not called artificial intelligence immediately from, from the start. So people talked about machine intelligence uh, at, uh, at an early point. So machine learning, for instance, you could also just uh, say now artificial learning. So artificial is, is supplanting this term machine. And at some point, we will not talk anymore about machine learning. Now, uh, actually, uh, a, a big branch of machine learning is called deep learning, right? Mm. Um, so uh, it's it's really an, 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 uh, uh, a term which was coined by uh, Turing and people around him in, in the 1950s when they were doing research in the UK uh, about the possibilities. It was machine thinking, right? That's mm -hmm. what... At that time, that was a term there for artificial intelligence. Can we maybe go, and probably not in too much depth, but the, the, the history. So you start somewhere with Turing in the 1950s. Yep. Um, first computers came up. People started talking about machine learning, uh, machine thinking. and yep. that. So how did it develop? So what kind of... Because you also mentioned deep learning, which is popular now. So that also came up somewhere. So how does this develop? How did the, the thinking about this develop? And how did the technology develop? Because, of course, computers in the 50s, you see them sometimes in a museum. Yeah. And then yeah. people putting flux into yeah. things, uh, which are very simple. So I think... Um, one, I, I think one of the biggest accomplishments of Turing is actually that he could foresee where they, this would go to. Yeah. But but how did this go? Just to, can can you give an overview together? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> maybe I can start uh, uh, broadly. So you you had these initial systems and and uh, uh, really development of basic computer algorithms that you can apply. Uh, two tasks such as uh, playing games or so, uh, uh, an early accomplishment of AI uh, was, for instance, uh, the ability to play checkers really well, right? Uh, and then chess. And those things are uh, things which are uh, hard when we think about it, but the algorithms are really not that complicated. They're relatively simple algorithms. You just, uh, the, the more data you can process, the more computational power you have, the further you can look ahead in the game, but it's the same thing all of uh the, the time. And then there started to be a little bit more lofty ambitions and uh, per, perhaps uh, uh, people got too overconfident about what would be possible in a short amount of time. Maybe you know something more about that? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so every uh, milestone we, we see in AI, there's uh, immediately a, a lot of people that uh, say, oh, so when now this is possible. This is a big leap, uh, so surely this other uh, thing will soon be, be possible as well. And we will approach uh, general artificial intelligence that could solve any problem that we throw at it uh, relatively soon. And uh, well, this uh, field of artificial intelligence is uh, surrounded by a lot of hype in that regard, but also from a lot of disillusionment because uh, these uh, anticipations are not always uh, did not always come true, and because of that, uh, maybe there's also uh, been more of a focus on uh, trying to model specific tasks like games um, to um, to demonstrate intelligence in that sense. Uh, but more recently, in, in recent uh, developments, uh, we see a shift back to. Um, artificial intelligence uh, models that have been trained to perform uh, one specific uh, thing, namely uh, language models, that uh, with some fine tuning can be applied to a much more uh, broad uh, sense of problems. Uh, maybe Emmanuel can 
Yeah. Talk so also that. to go a little bit back, right? So what 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 happens at that point, and and where do uh, we we can't cover everything, uh, but at some point there is this linking between the functioning of the of the uh, human brain and what you could achieve uh, possibly with trying to imitate that and then to try to make systems like that. And uh, there's an interesting uh, development in, in that respect is uh, uh, the perceptron, right? The perceptron is a, a, um, a supposedly model of a neuron, uh, one nervous cell that you have in your brain. It has input, it can do a calculation on that input and then uh, give an output. So it could, for instance, classify something that you uh, input on the neuron, you have different inputs, and based on the, those uh, different inputs, it could say that it's A or B, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you connect many of these, these things together, uh, then you can compute many different things. The idea was that you could have something that's similar to the human eye, which has all kinds of uh, um, uh, input receptors, nervous cells, something would fall like an image on that eye, but in this case, an artificial eye. And based on what the eye would see, you would be able to say, well, that's a cat, or that is a dog, or that's this, or, or that, that's the ambition. And so you have this modeling of the perceptron um, that is the start of what is called neural networks. And I think this is a, a term that many people uh, uh, have heard and know. And there, were, there was lots of expectation uh, uh, about neural networks. And it, I think it took about 40, uh, 50 years uh, before the really impressive results uh, started to show. So you had what is called a very long AI winter in between that, where you had many people, uh, researchers interested in AI doing work with those neural networks. But the results that they achieved were not impressive. I mean, as research does for long periods of time, uh, you don't always need to achieve uh, impressive results. But at some point, uh, due to uh, uh, some insights, but mostly the large availability of masses of data and the increased computational power uh, that, we, uh, that was available around uh, the beginning of the uh, new millennium, so 2005 to 2010, things started to speed up. And suddenly, those neural networks were able uh, to achieve spectacular results all at once. OK, um, sure. Um, you mentioned neural networks. Um, you mentioned 50 years, so they evidently came up in the 1970s or something like that. So. Earlier, earlier than that. Oh, even earlier, OK. Um, I. No, because you talked also about vision. Yeah. You say well, artificial eye, but what you basically mean here is there's a picture. Picture has pixels. Yes, a load of pixels. Exactly. Yeah. In 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 some artificially intelligent structure, yeah. and then it says, "Well, this is a cat." Now we know that it took a long time before computers could actually say this is a cat. Um, but there are results on that because the the early neural networks did do things. I, I know that that was why suddenly zip codes were introduced yeah. because the, the computers could trade zip codes on mail and then uh, no, maybe younger people don't remember, but there was a time that people got mail to your letterbox, you know, and, uh, and that, that's less now since we have email, but yeah. that was that was why zip codes were there. Yeah, yeah. so so that there and and there are also, I mean, could do that. Let's say could do that very imperfectly. There was probably a lot of mail that needed to be processed by uh, humans. It's still the case, by the way. Uh, today it gets better and better, but still, even uh, uh, in in the, the U.S. Postal Service, for instance, does all of this processing now, and it works extremely well to recognize the full address. By the way, not only the zip code, but still you have massive people who sort just a fraction of the letters uh, by by uh, by hand in uh, um, some center. Um, I can imagine so, that because sometimes I can't read, read my own handwriting, so expecting computers. So to read when we when we're talking about results, yes, you 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 had uh, initial results, for instance, with digit uh, recognition. That's a very very small task. Right. So uh, it doesn't but scale. Is it, is it really small? 
it's a relatively sm small uh, achievement. I, I, I think in the context of what we see now, the ability to recognize single digits, which was for a long time a focus uh, of uh, AI, there's a, a specific data set, the MNIST data set, that everybody uh, in, in an introductory machine learning course works on yeah. and try to predict the, the, the single digits with, with uh, all kinds of different uh, methods. When you put it in the context of what's happened in the last 10 years, that's a very, very small achievement. <laughs> but I am saying what we do in the last years is still the same thing except bigger? Two things. Okay. Much better data, as I said before, and amazingly uh, increased uh, computational uh, power, and then a few mathematical tricks and insights, and the, the ability to scale uh, these systems. But the, the data itself should not be underestimated. And so especially for the, the, the people who are here, those AI systems that we have today do not work without data, that the intelligence doesn't come by itself. When you have something like Google Translate, for instance, right? Or you use something like Google Lens, you point your camera to it, and then uh, you say like, uh, identify what's there, and then it comes up with uh, sometimes the correct answer. Uh, what's happening there, uh, the reason why that works is one part the systems itself and the inside of all of those mathematical tricks going on. But for a big part, it's the data and the massive amounts of data that go in there. So you can imagine that a system like Google Translate is trained on an enormous amount of uh, sources of uh, parallel data, right? So you have, uh, uh, I think, and you must have talked about this last week, you have, um, uh, for instance, European Parliament has texts which are translated uh, into all of the languages of the uh, uh, European Union, or most of them at least. And so you have all of these language pairs and massive amounts of data, and you can correlate those with each other. You know exactly what's being said in one language that corresponds exactly what the other uh, thing is. Another source of those data are subtitles from film and television. Right? So you have a subtitle film, a subtitle film. And if you keep feeding those systems with more and more and more and more data, they get better and better and better at translating. So it's a function of, uh, uh, of data. Image recognition, the same thing. And people should know, for instance, that when they're solving those Google captures, when they go into a website, what they're actually doing is providing labeled data saying like, here's a traffic light, here's a bicycle for those AI systems to, to uh uh, to be trained on, so that's that's human compute cycles. Yes, yeah, this, this leads me for two two questions. The first is you were talking about history, and you said well, AI winter was mentioned, mm -hmm. and no less interest. And now we don't have an AI winter, probably. Um, let's say, what's the AI winter that you mentioned, which started seventies, eighties, or something like that? Yeah. Did that last until? now or was there more in the history in between that's that's one question i had <laughs> and the other one well, let's 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 continue with this one first yeah, yeah. oh it, it it depends on the perspective you take but there's a there's a important milestone i think is uh imagenet uh right what's what's the year of imagenet do you know that's then i think it's probably 2014 or 2012 or something like uh like that mm -hmm. early 2010s yeah. yeah early 2010s and what happened uh, there is like AI has this benchmark tasks, right? So where different systems compete to achieve the best possible score on, our, on a particular task. And one of those tasks is predicting the uh, correct label uh, for a particular picture. So there's a picture of a cat, a dog, something else. Uh, and you need to be able to uh, uh, input the picture into the system and as output you get what's on uh, uh, the picture. And you train a system to do that, and then you give it a new data set that it hasn't seen, and you look at what the performance is on that. Many systems compete on that. In one of those competitions, there was one system that was submitted uh, to it, which stood out from uh, all of the other results, and that's ImageNet. And it's one of these first uh, uh, um, very successful uh, neural network uh, approaches. And uh, from then on, I think that the, this modern AI research has basically been dominated by variations on those big neural networks that you can uh, train on uh, 
uh, large data sets and with lots of uh, computational power. And that's been applied to a host of uh, other problems. So this approach has been very, very successful. But as I said, it's a function of the data and the access to computational power that make that possible. Yes, and I think this um, this task that you mentioned for uh, ImageNet to, to classify um, what is in images is um, a factor of why artificial intelligence uh, is has sparked so much interest because uh, to uh, like the average person this um, this task is very um, easy to visualize uh, we can imagine um, us doing this task and seeing a computer do it is, is very uh, cool and something that's very close to our own uh, 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 world and uh, the same goes for uh, language models, for uh, either generative models or, or classifying models uh, for language, that uh, we can really easily imagine um, this being applicable in our lives. And, and uh, we really can see these uh, results for what they are, uh, for seeing the image being classified correctly, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to maybe more theoretical um, uh, advancements, uh, such as the perceptron that you uh, that you mentioned earlier, uh, being able to uh, to separate two classes that are maybe uh, uh, split in a certain way that's hard for the perceptron that can be done by neural networks that string perceptrons together, mm -hmm. um, which is of uh, a lot of theoretical interest, but doesn't. Um, spark so much interest maybe for the public yeah okay yes i can imagine that because yeah for the public it is indeed what you can do and a lot of things are called artificial intelligence nowadays and um, probably also because artificial intelligence techniques are underneath but uh, people want to solve lots and lots of different problems but what i that was my second thing that came out of the whole talk is that the way you describe it is in incredibly mechanical so and if it's incredibly mechanical uh, okay we have a data structure we load images in it and lo keep loading images in it and then we check the labels and the keep loading and then uh, it classifies so then i'm thinking where is the intelligence <laughs> you see but that's exactly what's happening it's like from the moment it's able to play chess you know okay it can do that that's not intelligence anymore so it's we we would have obviously considered that some kind of intelligence but it's not human intelligence i think that that's a uh, that's something that that uh, you need to understand the 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 what people are trying to do and the successful applications of ai are usually doing something um that uh, humans can also do sometimes better, sometimes worse, but tirelessly, mm -hmm. without uh, having uh, breaks, without uh, the, the having strike, uh, and things like that. And so, in in that sense, it's akin to the uh, industrial revolution, right? So, where where you have machines which start to replace the manual labor that that uh, uh, okay. that. Uh, uh, you 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 have in the in the in the factories and suddenly you can do things by stringing uh, these systems together uh, by uh, uh, applying them to to a particular task that you were not able to do successfully before because it required many uh, uh, craftspeople to do a very specific task that you needed to be trained on for uh, a okay. long time. So I, I actually like this very much uh, as a way to make people understand what artificial intelligence is, namely um, say industrial machines replaced manual labor and and artificially intelligent machines can replace at least replace at least part of the uh, intellectual the, the intellectual yeah uh, yeah absolutely so that that's 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 a very good way of looking at and, it and and that's why I mean these these calculators right that's the same thing you're 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 replacing the, the the people doing the the the, the computation those <coughs> by the way are the original computers computers were sure. originally people um, called computers you're replacing them by a machine that does it uh, uh, for them first yeah. by punching in the numbers perhaps later just by doing all of those computations on a on a on a computer and it's still more or less the the same thing but there's, there's so many more things that we can do now.
Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that was actually the next thing that I would like to discuss. Okay, we are now in a point in time. There's a lot of interest in AI. A lot of things are happening. A lot of low-hanging fruit is being plucked. Where will this go? What what is, what is what are people thinking about doing with AI in the coming years? Or what what are things that you can foresee? You probably, you probably both have ideas on. I think on that's this. a question for Stan. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you are actually the future of AI. Yeah, um, <laughs> you are still also the future of AI. But thank you. For <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit. Uh, so last year, uh, uh, Doll E came out. Uh, which is a generative uh, model that uh, can well, generate a picture from uh, text input. And this uh, really strings together um, two um, uh, previously a bit more distinct fields in AI. So um, there was a lot fields? of progress being made in images, and there was a lot of progress being made in uh, language. And with uh, models like Doll E, these two fields are joining together again because um, you uh, give it some text, so there's language processing going on, and then it creates an image. So there's also uh, image um, uh, models uh, at work there. And uh, in uh, the start of uh, 2023, it's uh, expected that uh, GPT-4, a very large uh, language model, is uh, is has uh, finished its its training, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. So, uh, well, maybe that can take over some uh, writing or creating courses. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to that, and um, also because uh, such a big language model uh, has been shown to also perform well in in other. Um, tasks. Okay, yeah, because that, that would be yeah. that would actually be more interesting, I think, yeah. for me at least, uh, because what you're now saying is, look, we have uh, Dolly, and then we, okay, we make a better version of it. Okay, I believe that you can make a better version of Dolly because it's just ex expanding what we have, but more data, more yeah, computational more data, power. More computational power. <laughs> so, but but better, but, yeah. but are there other things which we can do, or which maybe which we're not thinking about, or maybe are thinking about, but which actually would be able to do, which, which we might be unsure about yet. Where is it going? Or is it uh, unpredictable? It's uh, surely very hard to predict. Also yeah, of because course. it's um, it's hard to, um, to say which tasks are uh, impossible for computers and which are just hard for computers and which with more data become feasible. Um, in, in a sense, um, but uh, the application of uh, language models to different tasks, then seeing uh, what kind of sentence this uh, this thing you give it is, um, is approaching more to a more general artificial intelligence. Maybe that's... you can say like what what the, what does Dali do for the people who are uh, sure. Uh, so Dali uh, takes in a sentence. So uh, you say, it, I want a picture of uh, the sea, and I want some rocks in the sea, and I want it to be like an oil painting. And then Doll E creates an image that um, looks as if it's an oil, oil painting of a rock in the sea. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really, I have seen some examples which were impressive, and I've seen many examples which were not impressive at all. And um, so I, I, then I think, oh, there's a lot of cherry picking going on That's here. Yeah. But on the other hand, how many examples have you seen of actually uh, humans doing these tasks and creating impressive oil paintings? Not a lot. Sorry, uh, so, so, yeah, so, yeah. That, that's that's the point. The <laughs> thing is that I also saw results, but I got the impression. Uh, so uh, give Dali the assignment three times to do something similar, and I saw basically the same image returning, the yeah. same side it's, table, the same bat. Um, we, we need to recognize it for what it is. It's it's yeah. incredibly nice that you can do that, but this is nothing more than you know text to image association. There's a lot of that in the world, right? Where you have pictures and you have descriptions of those pictures. A lot of those things exist. Those systems are really, really good at associating those things, figuring out all kinds of patterns that go in between them, but not in an intelligent way. It's really 
pattern recognizing inside uh, um, computers with with uh, uh, billions now trillions of free uh, parameters, uh, which all together create a system that looks to be creative, but it's still pattern association. What I would like to to say is like we also don't know how human creativity goes oh, if that is really different from 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 it, and if we are not just giant pattern associators ourselves. And that's a philosophical question, and, and I, I tend to agree with that. That you can complain that the computer is just repeating what it's already received, but for humans, originality is also pretty hard. Usually you're repeating things that you yeah. maybe didn't remember, but you are influenced by whatever you saw before. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, can, can I, can we lift, because the, here's the thing. So I can type in a sentence and I get a nice picture and another nice picture. And that's nice because I, maybe I can make a painting of it. And then, but is that really important? You can argue about that, but I think AI is important. Can can you tell me why AI is an important topic? Well, you what's see, your opinion on this? My opinion is that it's very important uh, for well everyone to know something about artificial intelligence because yeah, you okay, but, what, but is, you only need to know something about something if it is an important topic. So why is it important? Topic? It's important for the general public because everyone encounters AI on a daily basis. If you use a phone, you use AI. If you use your email and uh, find an email in your spam folder, that's AI. Um, if you Google something uh, or use another search engine to, to look up something on the internet, that's Nobody AI. Nobody uses another search engine. I do. <laughs> uh, but for science, it's also especially um, uh, important to, to know something uh, about AI because every field, whether it's astronomy or, or uh, economics, or uh, if it's uh, theology even, um, artificial intelligence uh, methods can really have a big impact on directing the attention of research to the right places. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, a kind of a positive view, but it's also instrumental. It's like you're saying like you should look at AI you should be interested in AI and AI is important because it affects your life. So in the same way, you should know what, uh, I don't know, um, uh, engineering is because you need to understand how all of those machines work that make your clothes and that build your cars. And I think some people are just not interested uh, in knowing how all of these things yeah. work. So is but, there more than, yeah. But that, you know, you're basically saying, you know, why it is important to know something about AI, and I can imagine that because indeed it has a lot of influence because it returns in many places. I was more thinking about the lines of the following. Um, let's say um, uh, Elon Musk wants to send a rocket to Mars because he wants to colonize Mars, and he can see, you can look at it in one perspective. You're wasting a lot of energy, a lot of manpower, a lot of resources to do something that is probably never going to work out anyway. Uh, and then, but you can also say, look, but humanity this is incredibly important because humanity will destroy itself in, in, in 25 years. And so we need to colonize Mars to survive. There are two, two views. And one says it's completely not important. And the other one says it's basically incredibly important. Probably the, the actual truth is somewhere in the middle. But I was actually thinking about, so, if, if AI would just be about creating pictures, it's probably not that important. Mm -hmm. um, but but are there things where you would say, well, actually, it's important for something, for the survival of humanity? Well, that may, may be a lot, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that, that's really interesting because then you, you, you're taking a very noble uh, view and you, you're thinking about uh, what kind of societal problems can AI solve for us, perhaps? And uh, I think very often that's going to be about optimization problems. So how can something that is really difficult for us to achieve right now be solved nonetheless? Because solving the, 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 the problem needs enormous amounts of computational power and specific uh, methods which have been developed in, in AI to solve the problem. And that could be, for instance, really into energy production uh, uh, distribution. Um, any you know societal problem that you can come up with, 
the worry that I also have with that is that uh, you would still not be looking at other ways to do it. And you would place a needed faith in uh, uh, a necessary faith in uh, AI. And as you said, the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle. In some cases, it's going to prove extremely useful. Uh, for instance, at uh, uh, sustainability, right? If you can uh, find uh, ways in which to do things which require much less energy, uh, for instance, and AI can help with that, that's great. It's going to be an amazing result. But at the same time, AI today is incredibly wasteful, right? Uh, I don't know, it's a, probably a few percentage of the uh, uh, global energy output is caused by training these very large models that do um, uh, text to image uh, generation. So these are all things that we need to uh, uh, take into account. Um, and as, as, as with many uh, other things, uh, it's how you use it that's going to uh, define if you use it for good or if you use it uh, for bad purposes and both are possible. Yeah, it's a very powerful tool and that makes it uh, very potent, but also uh, in a sense quite dangerous, especially if we forget uh, what's going on inside such a model. So uh, from a governance side, uh, letting an AI make decisions about uh, actual people, um, suddenly you're not in a lab anymore with just looking at numbers, but you're really affecting people's lives. So for people who uh, apply such a model and help it to uh, to make decisions for them, um, it's very important to to still know what's going on and how it works and uh, what the basis of this AI is. And and that would be then one of the reasons why people should know something about. I say so. Yes. AI. Yeah. So uh, you you even mentioned theology. I would not think that theology students would need to learn about AI. Which 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 students need to learn about AI? Would you say? I'd say for every scientific field, there is a, um, a scientific community that tries to incorporate AI into that uh, field. So uh, personally, I have a, a background in economics and there's people uh, using reinforcement learning uh, to well, let simulate um, firms setting prices and demonstrating some, um, well, some boring theoretical stuff about uh, markets. Um, for in the case of uh, theology, um, there's a uh, text analysis going on. Of course, uh, the success of AI is uh, dependent for a to a large extent on the amount of data you have. And um, I think the theologians have in a lot of data. Theology, uh, so there is a lot of text uh, for a human to read, uh, but there's uh, relatively to um, some other uh, AI applications, there's quite few uh, uh data uh, yeah so that uh, i think that is one of the major issues that there are lots of fields where there's a lot of data but also many challenging fields where there isn't a lot of data is there is there a chance for artificial intelligence to do something with those i see some nodding i i, I see um, you see me nodding because because it's a big problem and and it's uh uh there is an economic reality uh, to to what's happening in in AI. Uh, it's not like that. It's uh, being tried for many different things, uh, and uh, um, what you see in 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 the world today is that all of these big tech firms uh, develop AI in areas <coughs> where you basically know it's going to work. And okay, you you will have fields where uh, those methods are simply not applicable or will give uh, bad results. And that's usually because not enough data. And as a, as a point of comparison, I mean, these big language models that we keep talking about, they are trained on masses of uh, uh, data. Basically, you can download the entire internet and that's about what, what happens. But this is uh, more than you, you have in a million human lifetimes in terms of language information that you get in over your entire lifetime. These models are trained on 
orders of magnitude more 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 data than that. So that's the amount of data where things start working really well. What's surprising that humans do it with much less, right? Yeah, we do it intelligence thing like a, a, a child by 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 uh, um, two years old can can do an, an amazing amount of uh, very fancy tasks. If you look at it from from that point of uh, view of what we ask from AI, classifying objects, no problem, you know. Uh, but it's uh, um, so fields which do not have a lot of data. Uh, our uh, AI is useful, but, but it's going to be the classical AI before this, this data intensive AI comes along. And I think it's also really important for students to know those classical methods, because there is nothing worse than having uh, in, that thinking like uh, um, you have a hammer and every, therefore everything is a nail, right? Uh, or is it the other way around? You have a nail and everything is. No, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 that, but that's it. It's like the, the, the way people think uh, think very often today is because we have these very successful systems, any problem we'll have, we throw those uh, that exact ar architecture at that. Yeah. And that's 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 nonsense. But many of the uh, uh, achievements in, in, in AI in the past are uh, Bayesian networks, for instance. Those are very applicable uh, mm -hmm. to uh, many uh, problems which in, in involve uh, um, situations where you have uncertainty and uh, they uh, work admirably well with uh, orders of magnitude less data than... Uh, yeah, okay, so, so basically what the message here is, so if you're a student in any topic at all, you should learn something about AI. And if you then learn about the modern AI, and you think, yeah, but that wouldn't work for my field. Then remember that there's a lot of other AI as well that might be applicable to you. That's your what field. we teach them first, by the way. We don't do the 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 like the uh, in in even a bachelor students in in AI the really the the fancy deep learning stuff that's in their third year because you can't get there without knowing everything that comes before it. Um. So when we actually started out before we turned on the, the recording, you said, look, one of the interesting things is um, that originally AI started with artificial general intelligence. That was the ID. So an intelligence that can do the same thing as a human. Then it became more task oriented. But now recently it's getting a bit more, people are more interested again in the artificial general intelligence. Um, so I would like to hear a little bit more about that. But I was thinking, so uh, one of the things of artificial general intelligence is that it could be intelligent like a human. So maybe it can then work with less data. Um, so that's why I saw that link. Can you say something about it? Uh, well, the, um, the move towards uh, general uh, artificial intelligence, again, is um, from the well, mechanistic data uh, point of view. You have a model that's you give it data and you tell it what the data is. And then after some time, it has learned, oh, if, we, if you give it new data, it, uh, it says, oh, it's uh, a picture of this or the sentence means this. Um, um, recently, there uh, have been applications to models that um, were trained on a specific task, but perform reasonably well in some other tasks as well. So um, some people are getting interested in maybe we can then train like one big uh, model on maybe a, a, a broad task. But if we give it new tasks, uh, it can learn those tasks as well. And I guess that's um, how it is for us. Okay, so then, well. then, then the view of artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence would be if you can solve a lot of different tasks, then maybe you can just add new tasks to it. And also be uh, able to, from uh, your previous experience of learning tasks, to learn even more tasks. Interesting. So um, we are almost at the end of the hour. Is there something that you would like to add, maybe on your own research or something else? Well, I talked a bit about my research. I'm very... Uh, you did, yeah. Yeah, to, to hear about Emmanuel's. Uh, I, I think, I mean, once I'm going to get started on that, it's going to take too long, and we have about one minute left. So maybe we should conclude. Okay, <laughs> okay. well, then, um, 
I think we we have at least had some views on what artificial intelligence is and and how it works, and uh, have stressed the importance of it, which uh, I always like to do because I think it's really important. Um, and uh, then I rest for me to thank you for being here. And uh, who knows, we can talk more about uh, particular implementation of artificial intelligence in general intelligence in a in a later talk. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.